Psalm 147, verse 3 says this, Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Welcome to our studies in the book of Revelation. And in this segment, we're going to focus on the greatness of Jesus Christ. I trust if you were not able to watch our previous segment, then you'll take a moment to do that, where we focused on the first eight verses in Revelation chapter 1, that gave us the theme of the book, uh, reclaiming the kingdom. Jesus Christ coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the whole purpose of the book, uh, there in verse 1, the revelation, the revealing or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And today we want to focus on the revelation that John the Apostle specifically had of Jesus Christ himself. Well, let's start out in verse number 9, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 9. It says this, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And the verses go on to describe what John the Apostle saw when he saw Jesus in all of his glory. We'll take some time here to unpack these verses. In verse number one, we're introduced to John the Apostle. Uh, who was John? He, of course, was one of the disciples of Jesus, one of Jesus' twelve disciples. John wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, he wrote the Gospel of John, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and also the book of Revelation. And John refers to himself affectionately as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so obviously John had a very endearing relationship uh, with Jesus Christ while Jesus was here on this earth. And John the Apostle introduces himself not as John the Apostle, but as your brother and companion in tribulation. Now, what an encouragement. Uh, let's step back and put ourselves in that time frame in uh, first century uh, Christianity there in the early churches. They were enduring in intense persecution, uh, really from all sides. Um, some of their businesses experienced economic boycotts. Um, some were banished, exiled. Uh, taken from family and friends and home. Uh, others even gave their own lifeblood, uh, were thrown to lions at the Colosseum there in Rome, or even burned at the stake. These Christians suffered intense persecution. And John uh, is calling himself your brother in the midst of this uh, persecution, specifically in the kingdom and patience of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word patience has the idea of endurance. And the fact is all of us as believers will experience levels of suffering in this life. Um, turmoil, distresses, things uh, that just make life very hard. And this should be an encouragement that you and I, just as John did, enduring in the suffering that he was in and the believers there in that time frame, you and I are called to endure, uh, to embrace with joy any uh, suffering and trials that come into our life. And you and I can't do that in our own strength. Our natural response is to get angry and upset and even bitter, resentful at the people or circumstances in our life, and even at God. Uh, but may you and I just recognize that Jesus Christ, as we just look to Him, He gives us everything we need to have the right response, to give thanks, to embrace with joy the trials He allows into our life. 
So what a comfort as John says, I'm your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. And can you imagine the encouragement that this book of Revelation would have been to the believers there? Well, how did this revelation come? Well, notice the place. He says he's in the Isle of Patmos. You can see on the screen there the Isle of Patmos. This is uh, the Isle of Patmos. And back then, of course, there was no uh, people there except those who were exiled. So a very barren uh, wilderness area. Uh, and John has been banished there because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Here is a picture of modern day uh, Patmos. It's a touristy town uh, now and you can visit that place even today. But this is the place uh, where in first century, right around AD 95, John would have received uh, this revelation. And what is the revelation that he receives? Well, in verse 10, it gives us the means that he receives it. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And that word on, uh, the Greek word behind it, it's a preposition, could also be translated in the Lord's day. As I would see it, um, John may not necessarily have been in the power of the Spirit on a Sunday, as much as he was transported in his spirit to actually see the events of the day of the Lord unfold uh, before his very eyes. And so, can you imagine for John seeing the events of the future in real time? For us, that blows our mind because we live in a time-space continuum. Uh, but for God, he lives above time, and so that's not impossible uh, for God, he's able to actually, in fact, he does see the past, the present, and future all happening at the same time. And so, supernaturally, John is transported in his spirit to actually see the events of the future unfold as they're happening. That adds a lot of color, a lot of a drama to this book of Revelation. Well, he hears a great voice. And this voice is likened to the voice of a trumpet. Have you ever heard a loud trumpet sound? Well, this is what John likens it to, that loud clarion sound of a trumpet. And this voice is saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. This is none other than Jesus Christ, the beginning and the ending, the eternal one. What a comfort that is, that we, you and I, uh, we don't know the future, but Jesus Christ does. He's the one that knows the end from the beginning. He's already been in the future. And so that gives us confidence that since God knows the future, we don't have to fear. You and I can be secure. We can rest in the fact that He has everything under control and He knows Exactly. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week, next year, in the future, and on into eternity? Uh, this is a great comfort. Well, notice what this voice says. Not only I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, but he says, What thou seest, write in a book. So he's telling John to write these things down that he's getting ready to see, this revelation that he's going to receive. And he writes it, he's commissioned to write to the seven churches. And of course, as we looked at last time, those churches are specific churches in Asia Minor, in modern day Turkey, but they're representative of churches throughout the church age. And certainly applicable to you and I as individual believers who make up the church. And so he transitions to this great vision, this revelation that Jesus gives him of himself. It's an awesome revelation. And John sees Jesus as judge. What do you mean? The garb that is described, uh, that John sees that Jesus has, is the type of garb that a judge would wear. So John has not seen Jesus in his current role as high priest. We know he's our high priest currently interceding for us before the throne of God. But John doesn't see him that way. He sees 
Jesus in his future role as judge. He sees Jesus with a long flowing robe that extends from his shoulders down to his ankles. He sees him wrapped around uh, the waist with a golden girdle, literally a girdle made of gold. Can you imagine the sight? He sees his hair as white as wool. No doubt a picture of Jesus' purity, his perfection, his innocence. No doubt also a, a picture of his wisdom. 1 Timothy 1.17 reminds us that God, who is the only wise God, the fact is God knows everything about us. That wisdom is perfect. He's omniscient. Well, then John sees those eyes. Look at those eyes. It says they're like a flame of fire. They're like lightning. Literally, that's what the word uh, means, is they're lightning. They're piercing to the very depths of John's soul. And as we look at Jesus one day, as we stand before him, we'll see those same piercing eyes like flaming fire that pierce the innermost depths of our soul. Do you realize that Jesus sees everything about him? He sees what no one else sees. He knows what no one else knows about you. How are you living your life, my friend, today? Are there secrets in your life that you justify, basically? Well, no one else knows about them. My friend Jesus knows. And his eyes pierce to the very innermost parts of our being. Well, John also sees a sword, a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And no doubt, a picture of the Word of God, the sharp two-edged sword that Hebrews 4.12 likens the Word of God to, that pierces the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. In other words, he, he divides the motives from the actions. He divides the words from the attitudes, um, the thoughts, uh, from the actions, Jesus knows exactly what's going on in your heart and soul, in the innermost depths of your being. And that sword is a cutting sword that divides between those different areas, those parts of our life. He sees not only the two-edged sword uh, coming out of Jesus' mouth, he sees those feet those legs as if they burned in a furnace, literally glowing brass as if they burned in a furnace. Perhaps a picture of the brazen altar in the Old Testament tabernacle. Remember back in the Old Testament, they were commanded to offer sacrifices. And no doubt that brazen altar is a picture of judgment as it pictures the requirement, the atonement that is required for sin. It's the requirement of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Certainly the Jews, the Old Testament Israelites, they were uh, saved coming out of the Passover. Uh, the Passover is a picture of their salvation. And so the sacrifices... Uh, is more of a picture of their daily fellowships, their standing before God. Much like you and I as believers have the responsibility of claiming Christ's cleansing blood in 1 John 1, 9, in our daily walk, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this brazen altar pictures the judgment of sin that is required. And it certainly fits the picture of John as seeing Jesus as judge. Well, then he sees his countenance. How is it described? It says, the sun shining in his strength. You ever been outside on a bright sunny day? We can't even look at the sun. It's so bright. And yet the very countenance of Jesus, John sees as the sun shining 
in his strength. His voice is as a trumpet, but in verse 15, his voice is likened to the sound of many waters. What a thunderous roar that voice must have sounded like. Have you ever been to the Niagara Falls? Uh, perhaps you've been there and you've heard the thunderous roar of the water. I'm told that there's six million cubic feet of water that fall 170 feet every minute. Um, can you imagine that much water over that short a time frame every minute? Um, but that's the sound, the thunderous roar of that kind of water that the voice of Jesus is likened to. Well then, uh, Jesus, or John, transitions uh, into, after he's seen this revelation, the only response that John has is he literally falls at Jesus' feet as dead. He sees Jesus in all of his glory, and his only response is to fall at his feet. Can you think of anyone else in Scripture who got a glimpse of God's glory and fell at His feet? I think of Isaiah when he saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. The vision was so glorious, the posts of the doors of the temple moved, they literally shook at the voice of Him that spoke. Cherubim were crying one to another, Holy, Holy, Holy. Is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. And Isaiah's response was, Woe is me, for I am undone. He recognized his sinfulness. Job, he got a glimpse of God. Remember when God just pummeled him with so many questions, asked so many questions of Job. And Job said, I've heard of you. But now mine eye sees you. Wherefore I repent and abhor myself, or repent in dust and ashes. And John has a similar response. When he sees Jesus in all of his glory, he falls at his feet as dead. It's an appropriate response. My friend, all of us are going to bow the knee to Jesus. Perhaps to this point in your life you've rejected Jesus as your personal Savior. Philippians chapter 2 says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My friend, I urge you, I encourage you to bow your knee to Jesus Christ today and experience His mercy than to reject Him, to wait and face His judgment. And if you're a believer, uh, my friend, uh, we need to, as believers, to bow our knee in submission to Him on a daily basis, surrendering ourselves to Him, yielding in full surrender and submission to Him, to His Lordship. Well, notice the reassuring response, the reassurance that is given. It's um, found in verse number 17, simply this, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus touches John. He's, John has just seen Jesus, and John falls at his feet as dead. But then he feels that reassuring touch. And that reassuring voice that says, fear not. I'm the first, I'm the last, I'm he that's alive and was dead. Think about this, we never refer to anyone as, well, my uncle was dead. No, we say he died. But Jesus, we can say he was dead. Because he's no longer dead. He's alive. He's come back to life. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what man may say. 
I see his hand of mercy. I feel, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. I trust that's your testimony, and that gives us assurance, comfort, no matter what suffering, what trials, what hardship you're going through, Jesus knows what you're going through, and He's alive. He's wanting to enter in right in the middle of your circumstance, if you'll just open the door to Him, invite Him in, let Him in. Well, John receives that assuring word, fear not. And then in verse 19, write the things he receives this command. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So John is given a command to write the revelation he has just received. And by the way, all the things that will come hereafter. And he says, write the things which you have seen. Those are the events specifically referred to that we've already looked at in Revelation chapter 1. And then the things which are, literally the present state of the churches, the things which are, and then the things which will be hereafter. And that's the unfolding of future events, the events that are still future that we see even unfolded in the rest of the book of Revelation. And so John has given this command to write, and that's why you and I have these um, revelation, these um, insights, this vision into what God knows about the future. And then I want to spend our last uh, few minutes here on the last verse. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Remember, John has just seen a revelation of Jesus. And he saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of those candlesticks, he saw one like unto the Son of Man. And in the right hand of the Son of Man, none other than Jesus Christ himself, it references seven stars that are in his right hand. In verse number 20, Jesus explains what these are. It says this, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And so Jesus actually tells John exactly what these symbols represent. The candlesticks represent the churches, and then the stars represent angels. Now perhaps you've heard uh, the angels represent pastors of the churches. Uh, I used to uh, believe that. I don't believe that anymore. Here's a few reasons why. One, the word angels is... Um, never used throughout Scripture to refer to a pastor. It's never used to refer to a pastor. It is virtually always used to refer to a supernatural being, and especially in the book of Revelation. In fact, in just verse 1 of chapter 1, uh, it's an angel, and we don't take that as referring to something else. We believe it is a supernatural uh, being. Uh, number two is the Bible never uses symbols to describe another symbol. Now let me explain. So the Bible uses, even in verse 20, we saw the candlesticks as a symbol to describe an actual thing, churches. And we wouldn't say, well, candlesticks represent churches, which represent something else. No, uh, the symbol is used to represent an actual thing. And so we're given the symbol for uh, the angels. The symbol is stars used to represent angels. Uh, that's the second reason I believe the stars are angels, and the angels are not referring uh, specifically to pastors. And then the third reason is stars are often used um, to refer to angels. So Scripture uses that word stars to refer to supernatural beings. Um, in Revelation, it talks about, later on, it talks about a star falling from heaven, and to him 
once given the key to the bottomless pit. And again, that's using the, uh, the imagery of a star to refer to an angel. Uh, in Job, it talks about the morning stars singing aloud for joy. Uh, again, a clear reference to angels. And the word stars is used to refer to angels. And then the role of angels. I think this is perhaps the most significant. The role of angels, one of their primary roles, especially in the book of Revelation, is to either warn, observe, or carry out divine judgment. To warn, carry out, or observe divine judgment. And so this, obviously the book of Revelation is a book of fiery judgments. Um, judgment beginning in the house of God with these letters to the seven churches, but then to the rest of the world. And so it's very fitting that these would be angels that would be involved in observing, warning, and perhaps even carrying out divine judgment even to these seven churches. So it fits the context that these stars are angels, that these angels are in fact angels and not pastors. Uh, if you take another view, uh, that's certainly fine. All of us have a responsibility to uh, study scripture and we're accountable to the Lord for the, um, the um, decision that we come to, the way we interpret uh, scripture. But I commend that to you for perhaps further study uh, on your own. Well, we've looked at the revelation of Jesus Christ, transitioning into the seven letters to the churches. And I trust you'll be able to join us as we look at each of these as letters to the seven churches and how they specifically apply to yours and my life as believers. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.